On January 17, 2011, Professor Don Huber wrote a confidential letter to U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, alerting him that a team of scientists had discovered an unknown pathogen. The new pathogen was found in high populations in U.S. corn and soybean crops, specifically crops that have been genetically modified to be resistant to the chemical glyphosate and the number one selling weed killer Roundup. The new organism was linked to an epidemic of plant diseases that had spread across Midwestern fields and found in cattle and dairy herds that were experiencing infertility and spontaneous abortion rates as high as 45 percent. Professor Don Huber is an internationally recognized plant pathologist and professor emeritus at Purdue University. For the past 40 years, he spent his career as a scientist working in professional and military agencies that evaluate and prepare for natural and man-made biological threats, including germ warfare and disease outbreaks. As a plant pathologist, Don Huber is among the most qualified scientists in the world to examine such a serious threat to America's food supply. I'm curious why you wrote Secretary Vilsack the letter prior to the research being published. He had a decision to make relative to Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Mm -hmm. We didn't have answers that we needed uh, in this area at the time, and when you start applying glyphosate directly to alfalfa, is it going to be similar to, to increasing the uh, presence of the organism and the possibility in the alfalfa like it does in corn? If that's the case, we could very well lose the most critically important forage crop that we have for our animals. Mm -hmm. And it was a request for that funding so that we could get the answers and for him to delay uh, a decision until the answers could be obtained. The intensity of the problem is such that we can't wait the three to five years to develop all of that research and then finally get it published. These are preliminary results, findings that the, the science is still being conducted. The animal scientists, veterinarians, uh, it's not preliminary for them. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they've uh, very thoroughly documented what the cause of, of the uh, problems are for, in the infertility and the uh, spontaneous abortion situation. I had a uh, report last week of, of three new uh, herds in, uh, one in South Dakota and two in Iowa, mm -hmm. They're running 15 percent infertility, regardless of how many times that they tried, they couldn't get the, the heifers to settle. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, they were running 35 percent uh, spontaneous abortion. Well, there's no way to maintain uh, uh, an economic viability in that type of situation, and that's what growers are finding. But in trying to find out what was causing their, our animal producers to go out of business, mm -hmm. literally, uh, because of the high mortality and, and uh, inability to reproduce, that they started looking at the feed. Said, how are they being infected? Where is this organism come, coming from? Mm -hmm. They then traced it to soybean meal initially. Started looking at, at how, it would, how the soybeans would be infected. And you can find it in soil, the organism. You find it internal in the mycelium of the sudden death syndrome fungus. You also find extremely high titers or high populations of this organism in soybean sudden death infected plants. Can you tell us a little bit about the pathogen specifically? The organism is uh, can be seen only in an electron microscope, very small, about the size of a small virus. Uh, it's culturable, in other words, it can be grown in culture, uh, which we don't find with a virus. It's not a prion, it's not a mycoplasma. Very small, uh, does replicate, reproduce itself. Uh, very common. Uh, a hitchhiker with other organisms. I mentioned that it's been found in uh, the mycelium, in, inside fungi. Uh, grows very well in the presence of bacteria. It's infectious to uh, cattle, pigs, horses, uh, poultry. 
It will kill uh, a fertilized egg in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, animal scientists have done the Koch's postulates, that scientific process of, of establishing cause-disease relationship. But it's just an ultra-microscopic organism that's capable of reproduction, uh, so it's different from a virus, uh, <clears throat> very compatible with other organisms, appears to be very common in the environment, but for some reason, uh, much higher association and uh, colonization or, or population when we have the glyphosate interaction or the Roundup Ready. Uh, and especially where we see those diseases that are increased uh, by the glyphosate, we see also the higher population of this organism. Why are the issues um, with glyphosate relevant to the discussion about genetically modified crops? Glyphosate is the chemical name for that compound that mm -hmm. is attributed for herbicidal action. Mm -hmm. The uh, Roundup is a formulated product that includes other components besides just the glyphosate uh, chemistry in order, in order to increase its penetration into plant cells mm -hmm. or its activity as an herbicide. When you have a genetically engineered crop that's resistant to glyphosate, it not only permits the wider use of, of the glyphosate, the extended uh, exposure to it, but it also permits then the application of glyphosate directly on that crop, which many times we're consuming. What you see is that after a period of time of continued use of just one herbicide and increasing rates of that herbicide, which have been very dramatic in the last 10 years, that you see pretty soon that entire groups of organisms just cease to exist in the soil. Now you don't have a void in the soil, mm -hmm. so that if you pull one group out, you have another group that comes in. You have this uh, very dramatic change in the soil microflora mm -hmm. in that soil biota that affects these soil-borne diseases very dramatically. And that's because glyphosate is not only a very powerful herbicide, but it's also a very strong biocide, mm -hmm. very selective in the soil but it stimulates some of our soil-borne diseases and it also changes the soil microflora that affects nutrient availability then for the crops. One of those critical components in that soil microflora that disappears with glyphosate or is severely suppressed are those organisms that make manganese available for the plant. When manganese is reduced in the plant, again, it becomes very susceptible to this pathogen. And so you have a biological component that is very powerful because of the powerful biocidal effects of glyphosate, and you also have a direct effect of glyphosate as a very strong chelating agent. Now by chelator, we mean that's a chemical that can grab on to another micronutrient or other mineral element that's essential for a plant mm -hmm. and immobilize it. And when that's immobilized, then the plant goes into a deficiency or reduced efficiency, so it becomes much more susceptible than for uh, take all disease as well as many other diseases. The overuse of glyphosate or the reliance on glyphosate in the past 30 years, you're saying has created a system for a soil microorganisms where certain microorganisms have been killed off or no longer prevalent and it's allowed uh, inversely it's allowed a certain other microorganisms fungal other type of bacteria to be present the question is if in doing root damage is um, and inhibiting certain micronutrients in plant absorption is this actually decreasing the amount of the nutrient value of some type of food crops that we're feeding to livestock, but also to human, like corn and soybean products? Yes, in fact, my first real uh, attention to that item was uh, uh, from a phone call from a veterinarian in Iowa. And he had some clients that had very high disease levels in spite of all the drugs that he was trying to give them and trying to keep them in a productive mode. And he 
felt like it was a losing battle. When he would necropsy his animals, uh, those animals that would, were dying, uh, he would check the liver for uh, manganese specifically because manganese is very critical for all of our defense reactions and detoxification of the mycotoxins and those things. They were all uh, very severely deficient in manganese and he wanted to know why. Well, in Roundup Ready soybeans, for instance, there are scientific peer-reviewed papers showing that you have as much as a 48, 50% reduction in manganese in that soybean seed, soybean feed. We see the same thing in corn, a reduction. And uh, other micronutrients are reduced. Well, if the animal, if you're feeding the same carbohydrate and, and that, you're assuming that everything else has kind of come along the same, but the mineral content quite often is very significantly reduced, not just for manganese, but for other essential nutrients that then has a very dramatic effect on in the food quality as well as the feed quality for those animals that are being fed. And as this one veterinarian and many other veterinarians have found that it's not just an isolated situation, it's a much more general situation than was anticipated prior to that. When you have a manganese deficiency in an animal, it can cause uh, premature or stillbirth or abortion. Uh, the animals, or those uh, uh, stillborn calves, generally with manganese deficiency, will have kind of an arthritic appearance because manganese is required for calcium deposition. Same thing in, in man. So what, what are the overall effects that this is having on plants and, uh, and on livestock, on animals? I have a, a letter that, or an email that I received from a veterinarian in, in another state. Uh, and he said, I've been working three years trying to find out uh, why my hog producer that I'm supporting, servicing here, uh, why we can't make any headway to keep him in business. He said, I've, I've sent tissue in to, to various laboratories. We've checked for PERS. They've checked for uh, uh, clostridium toxins. They've, they've checked for viruses. All of the known causes, and he said they're always negative. And uh, when they've gotten that, I've been able to refer him to the veterinarians that can uh, identify the organism. Those veterinarians then in many situations, in a new situation where they haven't already gone through that very costly and long process of trying to find out what's happening, they've, they've gone in and they've actually done split samples and they'll send them in to check for all of the known causes. They come back negative, but it always comes back with this organism. Because of what we were seeing in both the plant epidemics of Gauss's wilt and sudden death syndrome that were associated with the increase in infertility and abortions in, in cattle, pigs, chickens, and, and horses, uh, that there was a, a direct concern with the continued use of our uh, abuse of the system without recognition of, of what those ties really meant because the problem is continuing to get uh, much more intense, much more damaging for our both our animal as well as our uh, crop production systems. What are some, um, I guess, crop diseases that, that corn and soybean farmers have experienced? The last two years we've had a very significant epidemic of Gauss's wilt on corn and sudden death syndrome on soybeans. We've had to increase the rate of glyphosate, so we've just continually hammered against those organisms that would give us some natural biological control of that disease. The mode of action mm -hmm. of glyphosate as an herbicide is to suppress resistance and increase disease. So that when you have any weed that's killed by glyphosate, you've increased its susceptibility to disease. Plant pathologists are also seeing that increased disease and the uh, inability to keep their crop production, their growers, efficient and in business. And then you look at the quality of that crop that's been produced 
which were growing uh, initially for, for food and feed, even if it's going into alcohol, the rest of that crop's used for feed. Mm -hmm. And we find very high populations of this organism in the uh, uh, distiller's grain. So it's coming through the uh, ethanol production, the fermentive process. Mm -hmm. Uh, find it very high in corn silage. So that the insling process seems to give it in an environment where it's even able to continue to grow even beyond what it did in the uh, regular growth of the plant. You know, so knowing what you know about glyphosate and its impact on other crops, I'm curious, uh, are you you're now more concerned about how Roundup Ready alfalfa will impact dairy herds, cattle, and hogs in the U.S. If this organism is associated with, with alfalfa after glyphosate application like it is with the corn and the soybeans, mm -hmm. uh, that one I'm, I would express a very serious concern. When you take our number one forage crop mm -hmm. and you place it in any kind of jeopardy, we have a tremendous impact on the sustainability of our animal production because with alfalfa as a perennial crop, open pollinated uh, with an insect vector, the bee is a vector for the pollen, that in five years you won't have anything except Roundup Ready alfalfa. Mm -hmm. There's no, no way that you can have any coexistence unless it defies all of the epidemiological data that, we, that we've accumulated for 100 years on plant diseases, there's no way to maintain uh, a non-Roundup ready uh, population of alfalfa. Knowing what you know and, and knowing the science so far, what you, what you understand, you know, what advice would you give to President Obama and Secretary Vilsack in terms of moving forward with um, the, the recent approvals of Roundup Ready um, alfalfa and sugar beets, would you advise them to hold off? Well, I put it in my letter, uh, a request that they would delay any decision until we had the answers that I feel are, are very critical and establish a need. Why, uh, why add another, uh, or why continue to abuse a system that we can all already see is badly abused? Mm -hmm but certainly uh, to delay any decision on, on planting until uh, the relationship both from a nutrition, which is rarely analyzed, and there's no question it's that the Roundup Ready isn't substantially the same as the non-Roundup Ready. Uh, it's limited data, but the data, all the data that's there says it isn't. Mm -hmm. And certainly with this new organism, it puts it in a different category all by itself. I'd really hope that there would have been a delay and, and that there would have been the resources allocated then to answer the questions that we've talked about. And to get a delay until we could get those answers to, to verify that we're not going to further increase the severity of, of this organism as it impacts in the animal industry but then also to get that relationship for alfalfa production because we have a couple of new alfalfa diseases that we're struggling with. What happens then on your number one forage crop if we see the same predisposition either to this new organism that makes it uh, a hazard to animal production, can we afford to just open the floodgates wide open? before we have the answers. What's the urgency?